All right. Wow. Um, that's, uh, I don't, pr I probably don't need to say anything after that. Um, I'm going to, but um, that was awesome. That was awesome. It was so good to hear. And uh, Francie, thanks for sharing your story. I know that's not easy and that's very brave of you to do. So thank you so much. Great interview. And uh, thank you guys for all you do. Thank you for all you guys do in the parish nurse uh, or uh, health ministry. There you go. Health ministry. Um, I know I've, I became conscious of my blood pressure thanks to that ministry. I never knew how sick I was until Bobby got a hold of me. So now I'm, <laughs> I think I, I, I was good, then I got up, and now I'm back to good. So, so we're good. All right. Uh, but thanks for every, all you guys do. That's amazing. Um, the, uh, uh, today we're going to be in John chapter number seven, and uh, we'll jump into that here in just a second. How many of you got confused when you walked in here this morning? How many of you are sitting in a different spot than you normally sit? All right. We have a center aisle now. And it's because we had a wedding in here yesterday. And uh, so we had a wedding in here that was kind of late. And so it ended up staying the same. Um, so if you want to get married this week, <laughs> now's your chance to walk down the center of the aisle. After this, I don't know about it. But uh, so see me if that's, if that's what you want to do. And uh, until about Tuesday. So all right. All right. John chapter number seven. We're in 25 through 44. The Jesus Divide. Dear Holy Father, God, please help us today. God, speak to our hearts. God, speak to us right where we need spoken to. God, we recognize our dependence upon you, God, and we, we ask that your Holy Spirit would lead and guide through this time and through what's to follow. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Jesus is at the Feast of Tabernacles, and um, I'm not clicking for some reason. Um, the, uh, Jesus is at the Feast of Tabernacles, and he's... Um, gone there uh, kind of undercover and we're going to talk about the Feast of Tabernacles in just a second. I got to get there really quickly um, but Jesus is at this feast. He's just revealed himself at this feast and um, am I good now? Yeah there we are. Ha <laughs> ha. All right so um, Jesus is at the feast. He's, he's, he's gotten up in front of everybody and now everybody knows he's there and, and that's where we pick this up and he says at this point, or at that point, at that point, so, I forgot my glasses this morning, so I can't look at that screen. I've got to look at this one. All right. At that point, some of the people of Jerusalem began to ask, isn't this the man they are trying to kill? And remember, in the, the last time we met, uh, they had said, we're not trying to kill you. And obviously they were because everybody knew about it. But they recognize him and say, isn't this the man they're trying to kill? The, the, the people that were trying to kill him were the religious elite, the Pharisees and Sadducees and the, the Jewish leaders, here he is speaking publicly and they are not saying a word to him. Have the authorities really concluded that he is the Messiah? So there's a lot of questions swirling about Jesus right now. Is he the Messiah? Is he not the Messiah? He's done all these miracles. Um, he's made claims sort of like he's the Messiah. But we know where this man is from. When the Messiah comes, no one will know where he's from. They knew he was from Nazareth. They knew he was Mary's child. They knew he was Joseph's kid, supposedly. And so um, they said, we know him. We won't know where the Messiah is when he comes. Then Jesus, still teaching in the temple courts, cried out, yes, you know me and you know where I am from. Stands up in front of everybody. Yes, you know me. You know where I'm from. I am not here on my own authority, but he who sent me is true. And we know who sent him, right? We know it was God the Father, and uh, it, wasn't, it wasn't Mary or Joseph. It was, it was his father who was God. He was conceived by the Holy Spirit in Mary, and, and you know that story as well. I am not here on my own authority, but he who sent me is true. You do not know him, but I know him because I am from him, and he sent me. Jesus is the full representation of the Godhead bodily, right? We know that. So here we go. Um, at this, they tried to seize him, so they, they tried to get him, but no one laid a hand on him because his hour had not yet come. So who's ultimately in control, right? At the end of the day, God's in control, and, and they, they were wanting to seize him, but they couldn't. 
because it wasn't his hour. And his hour being when he comes into Jerusalem and everybody uh, claims that he's the, uh, says he's the Messiah, they, uh, Hosanna, uh, and they lay the palm trees in front of him when he's on the, the, the colt and he, he rides in and uh, uh, then just a few days later he is uh, crucified. That was his hour and that hour wasn't yet so they couldn't seize him. Still many in the crowd believed in him They said, when the Messiah comes, will he perform more signs than this man? He's obviously somebody. He's obviously, he can do things nobody else can do. He can feed 5,000 people with with one lunch. He can can walk on water. He can heal people. He can heal lepers. He can can do all these things that we've seen him do. Will, Will the Messiah be able to do more than him? So there was a lot of questions swirling about who Jesus really is at this particular time at the Feast of Tabernacles. The Pharisees heard the crowd whispering such things about him. Then the chief priests and the Pharisees sent temple guards to arrest him. They had finally had enough. Said, oh, I don't care whether his hour has come or not. We are going to arrest him. So they sent the temple guards out to arrest him. So that's what's happening here. Then Jesus says, I am with you for only a short time. And then I'm going to the one who sent me. You will look for me. But you will not find me. And where I am, you cannot come. That's as big a condemnation as you can find. When Jesus looks at these religious leaders and says, I'm with you for only a short time and I'm going to the one who sent me. You will look for me, but you will not find me. You're not going to know me. And then where I am, you cannot go there. And thank the Lord, he allowed us in. Right? He, 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 we are his. We are able to go uh, to that place because we believe on his name. Now, the Jews said to one another, where does this man intend to go that we cannot find him? Where will he go where our people live scattered among the Greeks and teach the Greeks? And they had no idea, right? They just, they're just not seeing. The, they, they know everything about the word of God and Jesus is standing right in front of them and they can't see him. What did he mean when he said, you will look for me, but you cannot find me. And where I am, you cannot come. All right, now, so we get to that point. I want to talk about the Feast of Tabernacles for just a little bit. The Feast of Tabernacles, where Jesus is at this particular time. The Feast of Tabernacles, or the Feast of Booths, Booths is a, uh, that's the King's English. All right, Booths. And uh, that, that is, the, the Booths, however you want to say it. All right. Feast of Tabernacles is what we're going with today. All right. The Feast of Tabernacles is a, a, a celebration that God gave to the, the Israelites, which is an eight day feast that was supposed to be pure joy. It's supposed to be pure joy. It was supposed to be a celebration of all celebrations, the biggest celebration of the year, the funnest celebration of the year, the most joy-filled celebration of the year. The, 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 it, that's what it is. That's the Feast of Tabernacles. And they did a few different things. And one of the things was they tabernacled. They invited the whole world into pilgrimage into Jerusalem for this party, for this eight-day celebration. And they invited everybody into this celebration. And what the the children of Israel would do, they would build temporary shelters for themselves. And these temporary shelters for themselves represented when they wandered in the wilderness. And God provided for them. The ceremony was threefold. It was, it, was, it, was, it was put in place by God for, for a threefold reason. A threefold reason is this. Number one, to remember where God brought them from. He, they were to remember where God brought them from. And you remember when they wandered in the wilderness for 40 years. You guys know that story. When, when um, the, the, the 12 men went to spy on Canaan and 10 were bad and 2 were good. And uh, they, uh, how many of you know that song? Because that wasn't very funny to very f- many of you. All right, so anyway, uh, I thought it was hilarious myself. But um, they, they, they end up wandering in the wilderness for 40 years. And God provided for them daily. You remember the manna that came down from heaven. They had to stay in tents. And, and, and the tents didn't wear out. Their clothes didn't wear out. And God provided manna every single day. Enough for their daily bread. They couldn't take in more than that or we go bad. And every day they had to trust in God's provision. And then they needed water. You guys remember what happened with the water? When, when uh, uh, God told Moses to speak to the rock, what did he do? 
He got mad at the people and he smote the rock in the King James. He hit the rock in the NIV. And uh, so he hit the rock twice and water gushed out from it. And, and from that broken rock, that smote rock, that, 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 that beat rock, came out rivers of water that, that gave life to all those that partook. Right? And that's how God sustained the children of Israel through the wilderness. And so what they would do was they would build these temporary booths to remember back. And they did a, another uh, celebration, which was the, uh, called a water libation or the water celebration ceremony. And what they would do is every morning of this, uh, this celebration, the priests, right before dawn, all the people would gather. This was an eight-day celebration slash party and they said that hardly anybody slept during those eight days it was such a fun time and what they would do they would go down every morning and they would they would take this this uh, 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 golden um, pot and they would they would dip water from the pool of Siloam and they would come back and with great fanfare and everybody would be celebrating and dancing and they said they had uh, rabbinic acrobats you imagine that you, you hear about the, the Pharisees and Sadducees, you don't think acrobats, you know? And they're flying around and doing cartwheels and jumping up and down and dancing. And they would build up these platforms, these temporary platforms. So the women who, who couldn't, they, they weren't a very uh, equally valued uh, part of society at that time. And they would make platforms so the women could get up and watch and lean over and watch them dance and celebrate. And they would juggle torches of fire. And it was just, it was crazy. And they would take this water up and they would, they would praise God for where he brought them from. Praise God for what he's done this year because this feast was right after harvest. And everybody, uh, they would gather all the harvest in. And so they would celebrate uh, and praise the Lord for the water that he had given them for this year. And they would pray to the future with the dependence upon God that they had back in the wilderness so that he would provide once again the water necessary for their crops to sustain them for the next year. That was the water ceremony. And here's what it says about them, about the water ceremony. Um, well, there's what I said about it, but here's what it is. Oh, wait, this, some people think that's the actual rock. That was split. They found this near where they, some people think Mount Sinai is because where Mount Sinai really is. Some people don't think that was really Mount Sinai. I don't know. Kind of cool though, right? There's a rock in the middle of the desert that's split and there's like water, uh, there, there's irrigation like marks coming out of it. So feast food for thought. Look it up. Google it. It's kind of cool. And there's another picture of it. So here's what somebody said about the, um, whoops, I think I clicked too much there. All right, that's good. This is what, the, this is what, Somebody said about this celebration. Whoever has not seen the celebration of the water libation has never experienced the feeling of true joy. That's how cool this was. Great lamps of gold were hoisted. They said they were 75 feet tall. Great lamps of gold were hoisted with four golden bowls at the top of each lamp. Four young priests in training would climb to the top. <laughs> uh, sounds like Bible college. All right, uh, they had climbed to the top carrying immense oil jugs with which they would fill the bowls. Once lighted, there was not a courtyard in all of Jerusalem that did not glow with the light that emanated from the celebration in the temple. As the people sang, the righteous and pious men would dance before them while juggling flaming torches. The Levites, standing on 15 steps and descended from the court of Israel to the women's court, played on lyres, harps, trumpets, and many other instruments. Two priests who blew silver trumpets stood at the top of the stairs on either side of the entrance uh, to the gate of the court. Um, I think I have some more there, but it disappeared on the bottom slide. But it's really cool. And here was a prayer that they said during the ceremony. This is actually a prayer that they found in books that they, they actually, or in scrolls, that they actually prayed during the ceremony where Jesus was. It says, please God, those who pour water before you from the springs of salvation, may they draw water. Save now and bring salvation now. That was one of the prayers they said. So that's all happening right now in this place where Jesus is standing. And then this. Jesus stands up and says this. On the last and greatest day of the festival, Jesus stood and said in a loud voice, Let anyone who is thirsty come to me and drink. 
They're pouring out this water, thanking God for his provision, thanking God for the provision that he gave them back in the wilderness, thanking God for the provision he gave them this year, for the crops that he gave, and praying that God will give them water that leads to salvation, meaning the salvation in their minds of their country and the sustenance of their people through the, the, the actual water that comes down and nourishes them through the crops. But then Jesus, in the middle of that, stands up and loudly cries out, let anyone who is thirsty come to me and drink. Jesus is answering their prayers right in front of them. They're praying that God brings the waters of salvation and Jesus is standing in the middle of them as they're praying that prayer and says, if you're thirsty, come to me and drink. If you need water that, that, that saves and brings salvation, I am that water. Come to me and drink. Whoever believes in me, as scripture has said, rivers of living water will flow from within them. Now this is beautiful. This is beautiful, and here's why. Because Jesus standing up there is declaring himself as the Messiah. He's declaring himself as the giver of salvation. There is no doubt in the people who were standing there watching as to who Jesus was saying that he is. Jesus, in this statement, says, I am the Messiah. So we have to deal with that. Because Jesus said... I'm the Messiah. I'm the one you have to believe in to have life. And here's the cool thing. For, for, for most of us in here, we follow Jesus. And look what he says. Whoever believes in me, as scripture has said, rivers of living water will flow from within them. Throw from within them. What does he mean by that? By this he meant <laughs> the Spirit. Whom those who believed in him were later to receive. Up to that time the spirit had not been given. Since Jesus had not yet been glorified. Think about this. Those of us who believe in Jesus. According to Jesus himself. Said if you believe in me. Then the waters of life will flow from you. And that meant the Holy Spirit. And from us. Who believes in Jesus. Waters of life. Flow through us. Through the spirit of God. As he works through us in our neighborhoods, at our jobs, in our communities, and in our church. And I'm going to elaborate on that in just a second. That you think about that. When, when, when God built the tabernacle, had Moses build the tabernacle in the, in the wilderness, and, and he prayed, and, and, and the fire fell down, and, and, and everything happened, the tabernacle was the place on earth where God chose to dwell. Then the temple happened and Solomon built the temple. You guys remember that? And he prayed and the fire fell down and, and God's presence came down and he was pleased and he came down and, and, and that temple was where God chose to dwell. You know what the Bible says about us? We're the temple of God. What? Know you not that your bodies are the temple of the Holy Spirit. We, right now, those who follow Jesus, are, we are the place on earth where God chooses to dwell and his Holy Spirit flows from, out from us. Keeps going. The reaction to this says, on hearing his words, some of the people said, surely this man is the prophet. Right? Some of them said that he, he's a prophet. So, so he's, he's a prophet. Others said he's the Messiah. Some just flat out said it. There's, there's mixed reactions. Still others ask, how can a Messiah come from Galilee? Does not scripture say that the Messiah will come from David's descendants and from Bethlehem, the town where David lived? Jesus was saying he was the Messiah. Thus, the people were divided because of Jesus. Some wanted to seize him, but no one laid a hand on him. I've got to... To, I, I want to wrap it up here in just a second, but I've got two points uh, of application here. Two points of application from this. Number one, what are you going to do with Jesus? What are you going to do with Jesus? You've got to deal with it. If you don't know Jesus, if you're just here, what are you going to do with the truth that Jesus actually claimed to be the Messiah? There's a few different things you can do. Number one, you can believe. I recommend that one. And one, you can believe. That Jesus is the Messiah. Number two, you can think, well, he must have been a good guy and kind of just hedge your bets a little bit. And number three, you cannot believe. You've got to do something with him. 
You've got to do something with him. His, his claims are too big and bold. He's either the Messiah or he's a liar. What are we going to do with that? What are we going to do with that? Now, for those of us who are followers of Jesus, for those of us who are followers of Jesus, I want to concentrate on the part where he said that the water of life, rivers of life would flow from us. Now, are we living in a way, are we living in a way that when we react to what happens around us in the world, that when we react to what happens around us in the world, it looks like what everybody else, whether they know Jesus or not, would do? Or do we react in a way that makes people have to ask those same questions about Jesus? Do we react in a way that, that points to something completely different? The other day, um, I've got a few examples but the other day something happened and I don't know if the guy was a Christian or not. I really don't. I haven't looked it up. Or I couldn't find it. So there was a guy in a courtroom. His brother had been shot and killed by uh, his neighbor who came. She, she was a police officer. She came into what she thought was her house, but it was his house. And she thought he was a burglar. And so she shot him in the chest and killed him as he's sitting there eating ice cream on his couch. Shot him dead. And his brother was, was, was in, addressing the court after, after the guilty verdict had come down. He was addressing the court. And as he was addressing the court, he asked if he could give her a hug. How many of you saw that? And he comes down and gives her a huge hug. And it lasted quite a while. To me, that's an example of the rivers of life flowing through somebody. You say, well, why is that? Here's why. That's not what normal people do. That's not the natural human reaction that caused people to stop and say, wait, what's going on? What is that? And some people say that's perverted. That's terrible. That's awful. How could, she, how could he do that? That happened. There are people saying that. And there are other people saying, wait, what kind of love, what kind of peace, what, kind, what must be going on in him that, that he could do something like that? Are we reacting to situations in our lives with our neighbors, with our friends, with circumstances at church, uh, with people that drive us crazy, with people that maybe make us mad, with people that maybe uh, uh, just flat don't like us or whatever else it is? Our husbands, our wives, our kids, are we reacting in ways that cause people to stop and think, what's going on there? There's something different. There's something different. And bring people to the place where they say, what's going on? Where did that reaction come from? You guys remember, real quickly here, you guys remember the shooting in Charleston. Is it a time in our country when St. Louis had happened? Uh, 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 the, the, the hands up, don't shoot thing was going on. Uh, Black Lives Matter was heating up. And, and, and a racist, a, a, a racist person walks into a black church welcomed into their Wednesday night Bible study in Charleston, South Carolina, welcomed in to study with them, all black church. The, uh, this white kid comes in and they're like, yeah, come on in. No worries at all. And the kid stands up in front of these, uh, uh, all these folks just praying and asking God to be with them and starts shooting them and kills uh, multiple people. And all of us are like, What's going to happen now? Because everything's on fire. Everything's hot. Everything. And they could have started as big a war as they wanted to start right there. They could have done it. But they didn't do that. They did something that, that caused rivers of life-giving uh, water to flow out from them. They loved and they forgave. And when they did that, it squashed everything down and made people say, what's going on there? Who is this Jesus they claim to follow if that's the reaction? 
There were anchors on CNN that were talking about this and started crying because they couldn't get their heads wrapped around what had just happened. Because of somebody acting in a way that was otherly, that was different, that that was life-giving, not life-taking, that was self-deprecating, not self-building, that was was life-giving to people. They acted in a way that Jesus would act. And it caused people to take another look at Jesus and say, who is this person? Are we doing that? Let's let the Holy Spirit flow through us. And when we have these these natural inclinations to, to lash out, to go at somebody, to get even with them, to have vengeance, to do whatever it is that would be natural and everybody would say, I get it. Let's stop. Let's pray. And let's ask God to let those, that water that flows and gives life, not takes life, but gives life, to flow through us and change those around us so that we act in a way that points to Jesus and not to just like everybody else. Because we have Jesus in us and he's not like anybody else. He's otherly. And he loves unconditionally. He forgives freely And he shows grace where no grace is deserved. Where sin abound, grace much more abounds. Let grace abound in our lives as we react to the world around us so that they may see who we already know in us. Dear God, we just ask that you would be with these thoughts. Thank you for what you said at the Feast of Tabernacles, that you stood up and boldly proclaimed yourself Messiah. May we do the same through our words and through our actions. In Jesus' name, amen.